all, welcome to the Table Talk Podcast, where we sit down, pull up a chair, and we get started. This podcast is designed to provide you packed full of information to help you with your training, nutrition, lifestyle, and well-being, where we interview myself through case studies to give you lifetime experience. And then we also interview high-performing individuals or other career-focused people who are looking to make changes in their lifestyle, training, nutrition, and well-being. So let's pull up that chair and let's go. Yo, yo, welcome to Table Talk, where we have a special guest and a good friend, Kathy O. Yes, Kathy O is a health and wellness coach and also a good friend of mine and client. So I've worked with Kathy for the last two years um, and really watched her grow from not just a nutrition dietetics um, practitioner, but to a health and wellness coach. So we've got her on the channel today to actually find out more about herself and also what she does, particularly with clients. We'll throw some doozies at her, some questions that maybe are a bit of a challenge. We'll see how she handles it, and then tune in next month with some more information and juicy topics with Kathy. So today is all about her, so she may even tell me what I have to ask her. So pull up a chair and enjoy. Kathy, talk hey. to yourself. <laughs> hey. Yo, 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 yo. Give me the doozies. <laughs> <laughs> all right, doozy one. Who is Kathy O? Are we being serious? <laughs> of course we're being serious. Well, I guess, you know, you've got a website that says who you are. You've got a website that says, you know, if anyone wants to know Kathy's qualifications, longer than the screen, um, this is probably going to get edited. So we're just going to be like, here, 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 here. And all of her qualifications would have just popped up on the screen. Cool. You know, um, so really... Probably take us through the journey of Kathy, because I know for you, a lot of your, you know, some people when they, like, I know I always wanted to be a trainer. I always wanted to work in health and fitness. Like, it was just my upbringing, my experiences. Some people go, I don't know. I'll go study law. A year later, they defer. So really, uh, from when we first spoke, your experience came from, I believe, 14, coming back to Australia. That's yeah. really where your journey started. I guess that would be great to know where you started and like that journey of where you went to and where you are today. Sure, 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 sure. Let me take over. Um, <laughs> here's the thing, Carl. I was 18 years old when I went back to Croatia for the first time. So we moved around a little bit and went back to Croatia and had a look at my old books and actually, I know that kind of my health and wellness journey started with the struggle at about 16 years old when I went through an eating disorder. However, looking back at when I was seven years old and I was 18 when I was looking back, when I was seven years old, I actually found printouts that I printed out when I was seven, looking up the health benefits of lycopene in tomatoes for skin health. So... Even at the age of seven, I had this interest in nutrition. I didn't really know much about it other than, again, printing out and also probably magazines, reading up on these things. But then when I returned to Australia at 14 years old, I really struggled with school, with the language, because English is my second language and I only had a grade two level English, so I had a lot of catching up to do. I had one really good friend at school and suddenly I went from this social butterfly extrovert in Croatia to a very introverted person that was very shy and struggling with my grades because I was so used to being top, top of the class. Top dog. <laughs> I is that the lysopene? The lysopene. <laughs> yeah, what is that? So the lysopene is an antioxidant in tomatoes that helps protect us from sun damage. Um, so, so we've got protection and we're a top dog in school. That's it, right. that's it. And this is 14? Yeah, so I was 14 years old when I came back to Australia and about 16 when I started starving myself. I think I was my lightest at about 17 years old and starting my recovery from the eating disorder. I got down Your to... lightest at 17. Yeah, I was got I got down to 40 kilos. So I'm 170 centimeters tall, five foot seven. And Just, I, uh, it's for everyone, I'm 176. I am taller. <laughs> Top dog. 
I got down to 40 kilos. So I was skin and bone, skin and bone, hip bones, uh, clavicles, very, very, very pronounced. Um, I hid in baggy clothes, my uniform. I was swimming in my uniform. Um, I kind of fell between the cracks in my family until it was summertime and mum noticed. Hang on. And you were swimming in your clothes? Yeah, like there was a lot of room. Oh, okay. So you weren't like, I'm going for a swim, yeah. just jump in the water and be like. No, I never oh, went to the beach. Swimming, I'm like, but this is the thing. Okay. Right? I never went to the beach. So mum never saw me until really late into it. Yeah, right. And that's when she panicked. Um, so that's when I started opening up to my family a little bit, mostly to mum, and admitted to them that, yeah, there, there were days that I was only eating one egg a day and going to school, and I was still getting my straight A's. I was still getting 90-plus percent, um, and I put it down to mindset and having that competitiveness with myself more than anything. A few of my friends were dieting at the time, and I just took it to that extreme. I wanted to make sure that I was the skinniest in the group, and I wanted to make sure that I did it the best. <laughs> I went to win in anything. I was top dog, top dog in anything you did. That's it. Wow. Um, so, to go home. so I was about 17, 18 years old when I started my recovery, and I started going to a dietitian and a psychologist myself, and I was – that person and that friend that just knew random facts about food and I would come to school and I'd be like hey did you know that blueberries have a lot of antioxidants they can help you with your memory so make sure you're eating plenty of blueberries before the exams and whilst you're studying um and you know if someone was having some skin issues I would have been like hey have you tried cutting out dairy it can cause some issues for people back then I didn't know the, the mechanism be behind all of this I would just kind of accumulate these facts and learn different things about food, what, where I would read it and through the dietitian as well. So I got to the end of year 12 and I thought that I was just going to study business because my dad had a business at the time. So I thought I was just going to go into business and commerce, but it was that one really good friend, shout out to Adriana for really um, bringing to my attention that I had this interest for food and that I can actually study dietetics. I didn't put one and one together until later. I didn't even think, you know, sitting across from a dietitian that this is something that I could do and really use that experience and really use that struggle to help others, which is kind of what led me to where I am now. So, the way that I see it looking back is studying nutrition and dietetics was part of my healing journey. So it was it was just the beginning for me. That's not where my career started. Like what I do now is very different to what I was taught at uni and to what I did straight out of uni. It was very clinical dietetics. Mm -hmm. um, I've really expanded what I do based on the... Whoa, 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 whoa. We're skipping years here. Woo! <laughs> Let's pull back. So we're 18, we finished high school and we're like, business, that's where I'm what I've got to do because that's what dad does. How did you feel, like energetically, how did you feel where you're like, yeah, I'm going to study business or like, yeah, I'm going to study business. I'm the top dog, like with 40 kilos, you're like <laughs> something going on, but I've got this. Um, you have a skin condition, no dairy for you. Uh, you stress too much. You need antioxidants is my belief. Um, is that what you were, that's where you're at 18? So at 18, I made the switch pretty quickly once I heard about dietetics. So business kind of wasn't my priority anymore. It was on the list, but it was way down the list. I was looking at getting into nutrition and dietetics at Wollongong as my first priority and then at Sydney. Um, and then I kind of put business down the bottom just in case I don't get into nutrition and dietetics. And, you know, thinking about, doing business and getting into business and being in the family business, I was not motivated. It felt mm -hmm. like life was determined for me. It felt like it's not really me. Um, and I was fortunate enough to get my first preference and study nutrition and dietetics at Wollongong. Yeah. And my passion for nutrition grew from there and from my passion for nutrition and dietetics grew my passion for overall wellness. Yeah. And um, interesting now, uh, today you're running your own business, so you need business. 
<laughs> but I grew up in a business environment. You know, my dad yeah. had his own business. My mum had her own business. And I was always working behind the scenes for them. So it's something, and you would know this as well, you learn best as you're doing it. Oh, look, I wish I just had a crystal ball that I could put my hand on and be like, oh, I have all the knowledge um, sometimes. Though, um, okay, so we're 18, business, meh. Someone goes, all right, Kathy, time to do this. You're like, yes, I, I'm really interested in this. Um, is, and you're giving advice to people about health and wellness. Were you taking any of that on? Were you like, oh, you should take blueberries. Oh, maybe I should take some more blueberries. Yeah. You should have take out dairy. Maybe I should cut out dairy. Absolutely. I, throughout the whole thing, throughout my eating disorder, throughout my recovery, throughout university, I was always trial and error and correction. That's my thing. That's my belief. Trial and error and correction. I was trialing things out, seeing how it affects me and just correcting myself. What's going to work for me? What's the right thing here? As I was, like I said, as I was studying nutrition and dietetics, I learned more. I applied it to myself. As I learned about the Australian Guide to Healthy Eating, I started eating like that to see how I'm going to feel. As I learned more about different types of diets and how it affects the body, trial and error and correction. Um, and this went on for quite a while. Um, and the recovery from an eating disorder is not linear. It's not linear. It, it was up and down throughout uni. And it was initially started as starving myself. And then you can imagine, you know, when you starve yourself for like two years and you start eating again, your appetite returns. Your body wants nutrition. So you start binging everywhere. Um, so I had my, you know, I was binging on peanut butter jars. I was binging on Tim Tams at times. I, I went through all of that, the ups and the downs and the highs and the lows and the self-talk and what we tell ourselves. And then, you know, making up for it, being like, oh, no, I've binged. Now I need to starve myself the next day. I've been through those roller coasters. So I think that's something that my clients really appreciate, appreciate about me is that when they talk, I get it. I've been there. I've done that. I know what goes through your head. Um, so it was two and a half years into my uni degree that I burnt out. I was working like five different jobs at the time, maintaining my high distinction, credit averages. Um, so still I was top dog? Still top dog, absolutely. Still pushing. Uh, why do it in one? Why do it in one job? We can do it in five. Yep. Okay. That's it. That's it. Yeah. So I took Very a lot of at home as well. Mum went overseas and I took on her jobs as a carer. I took on babysitting. I was still working for my dad in the office. You know, I was a full-time student as well, making sure that I got all these grades and I maintained the household. We had a household with um, three grown men working on the building site, um, my brother's wife and baby, and I was cooking and cleaning and doing the laundry and the whole lot. Um, I really burnt myself out. And that's when I relapsed with my eating disorder and I decided I needed a gap year. It was the hardest thing that I had to admit to myself and to my father because we're not quitters. <laughs> and he was like, oh, you're just putting off and, uh, your studies for a year. You're never going to come back. For me, the, it was never a question of whether I was going to come back to study. It was the healing journey. I really needed that year to correct myself. Like I said, course correct realign, have a look at what's been working, reflect and really show myself compassion and self-love so that I could properly heal from that eating disorder and rebuild that relationship with myself. Mm. There's a few parts there. So let's go back a little bit. So from 18 to 20 and a half, 21, you're learning all these new things and you're applying them. So if for example, the World Health Organization would say you need three grams of quality fish oil. Would you be taking it at face value and go, cool, no. I'll do three grams? Or you're like, I'll, I'll quadruple it. At this point, Carl, all I was learning was biostatistics, anatomy and physiology, 
and very little nutrition and dietetics. This was oh, assignments, group work, stress, going to uni four or five times a week, doing labs, showing up, making sure you get shit done. Like there was very little that I could apply until about two years into the course and when I took that gap year because, like I said, when I burnt out, I was in a very bad headspace. Mentally, physically, I, I didn't feel my best either. I had uh, very high cholesterol. I did... I remember doing blood tests. I remember really urging my doctor and saying, I don't feel well. I don't feel like myself. Something is wrong I, in my body. And I really pushed to get those blood test results. And when they came back and they showed high cholesterol and it was at like almost seven, for a 20-year-old to have cholesterol of seven, like that's stress as well as the binging that I was doing. And that really put things into perspective for me and I got like this judgment for him for being a nutrition and dietetics student and him saying you know what to do honestly Carl I had no freaking idea what to do I was not taught about high cholesterol yet we learned about that in third year maybe after three and a half years so and by that time you'd burnt out and mm -hmm. you've up here so you've mm -hmm. done all this You've gone in thinking, I'll learn all these things that I can better help people, and it hasn't happened, and you're like, damn it. So what did you then do? So we're a carer, cleaner, cook, working for dad, doing mum's work, managing business, Are you st and you're still fluctuating in and out, uh, binging on food. On the binging of food, would you justify like, oh, it's organic peanut butter, I'll eat the whole jar, it's totally fine, or just anything that would fuel you? I wasn't even there with the organic and the healthy versus non-healthy. Like I was binging on Tim Tams at times. I was surviving. I was surviving. I was not thriving. I remember binging on oat bars as well, music mm. bars, oat bars, peanut butter from the jar, um, and Tim Tams. Those were my go-tos. Um, and it just spiralled. And I didn't know how to stop myself back then. And I didn't know how to show myself the self-compassion. I didn't know how to snap back, right? So nowadays, if I'm feeling hungry and I give myself extra food, it's like, fine, the body needs it. And we get back on track. And there's actually, nowadays, my mentality is there is no track. It's just life. <laughs> it's just data and life. Data and life, yes. Data and life. Um, <laughs> So, okay, with that, um, we've now taken a gap year. So we've hit burnout. Didn't really get what we were looking for in the course. What happened in your gap year? What did you do? That gap year was the most important year of my young life that set me up for the next seven years of my life. I set myself a goal. I set myself a purpose of travelling Europe. My best friend at the time, Adriana, who chose my course for me or let me know about it, she was in Paris studying. So I decided I'm going to go visit her while she's in Paris studying. Um, and I organized a few other trips around Europe. Uh, and suddenly I had a purpose to get up, get motivated, do these jobs and earn money and save money so that I can travel overseas. So I removed the pressure of needing to study for uni. So suddenly I'm not a full-time student anymore. So I've got extra time. Um, so it was much easier for me to maintain the work that I did for my mum and my dad and um, the just the work in general because I was motivated. I want to save money. I want to travel to Europe, right? And with that, I was motivated to feel my best again because I wanted to serve better, work better, earn more money, save better and feel better so that I can just bring happiness to people as well and be happy in myself. So suddenly it was a really big mind shift from I have to do all these things and I have to be all these roles for people who I want to. I want to go to work. I want to earn money. I want to feel my best self. So that's when I started really fixing up my nutrition and dietetics, my own personal habits, and really 
I think one of the biggest things that helped me was drawing on the discipline that I knew that I had during my eating disorder because you can imagine how disciplined I had to be when I was starving myself, when I was following all these different um, diets and cutting out foods, like that's discipline. So now I used the discipline that I knew I had to actually eat healthy and to exercise in a healthy way. Mm. And so what weight were you sitting at then at 20? I would have been from memory I would have been somewhere around 58, I reckon. I hadn't reached 60 yet. I would have been between 55 and 58. And this is the other thing, right? So I love that you asked that question because I'm sitting at 70 kilos now, anywhere between 70 and 75, and I know that I haven't finished growing. Back then, I, I wanted to keep myself small. You know, I went from 40 to kind of a healthy 55, 58, still really lightweight. But it's like the thing that no one tells you is that you're still growing throughout uni. You're not your full adult body size and you're going to put on weight and you're going to change clothes sizes, right? So mentally it was a battle for me as well in accepting that. And I don't think I really accepted that until I met you a few years ago, you know, like three years ago and finally stopped shrinking myself and keeping myself small. Mm. It'll line up with our conversation last week and this week. Mm, constantly growing. <laughs> um, but we won't talk about now. We'll continue the journey with Kathy. So we're at 20, about 4.55 to 60. Um, and we're going to see Adriana. Who's, what was she studying? She was studying um, international studies and law. Yeah, I know. Okay, wow. <laughs> and... So did she? So she didn't know much about nutrition dietetics. She was just like, "You nutrition dietetics now, don't go business. What about no? Nah, what about nope, nope, no, 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 no. This is the degree. Go do that." And you're like, "Okay." And so you've gone and done a degree, and you're like, "This is nothing I expected it to be." Yeah. So oh, oh, sorry, I dropped my eyeballs. Um, let me let me take a break uh, for a year, and now we're going to go see Adriana. Did she know you were coming? Were you, or were you like, I'm going to surprise her? No, no, she she knew. It was very much planned. Um, I still remember it because actually, Carl, it was during the um, terrorist attacks that happened in Paris and mum didn't want me to go. Mum was like, go back to Scotland, go back to Edinburgh, go see your brother again. I was like, well, Adriana's all by herself. This is actually the perfect time to actually be that person for her. So I still remember that and at the perks, of going there was the fact that there was no line to the Louvre. We just walked straight <laughs> into the Louvre. It was so good. <laughs> I felt it, I felt safe. I safe. wanted to see you. And <laughs> mom's like, there's terrorists. Mm, no one tells Top Dog what to do. But there was lots of there stuff. are no lines. So I will save time. Mm. Okay. Mm, fair point. Okay. Agreed. Agreed. So I came back from that trip. Yeah, I came back from that trip and I, again, had a bit of a downer because... Oh, the oh. lines. Oh. <laughs> Tell us about the lines coming back to Sydney. Oh. I was on a high from all the travelling and I came back to Sydney and I went down a little bit again. I spiralled during my 21st birthday. Um. Like I said, the journey is not linear. It's really up and down. And this is when um, after my 21st birthday, and we're going to talk about this a little bit more later, but this is when I got my breast implants, which I've now explanted. So mm. I, again, it was part of my journey. It was part of my healing, my relationship with food and my relationship with my body. Um I always felt like a boy growing up. I always felt like I was missing out. I never went to the beach because of it, really low confidence. And I spoke to my mum about it I'm just shortly because I know we'll get into this later. She was very supportive and understanding and I went through that surgery and about eight weeks later we travelled Europe again. So during my recovery I was travelling Europe 
And it was when I came back from that Europe trip that I went back into uni and I was studying again and slowly picking up more responsibility again. And the final year of uni was all placement and thesis. So really working on a massive research project and it chopped and changed between the two, which was really hard. But I got sent everywhere. I got sent to Bathurst Hospital. I lived in Wollongong for a while. I was working at Prince of Wales Hospital for a while. Um, Bega Hospital, which is where I got my first job as a clinical dietitian straight oh, out wow. of uni. So many questions here, Cathy. Slow uh -huh. down. Um, so, okay, so you've gone. So we've seen Adriana. Number one, did she kind of put you back in line so she was the person that put you on the, the degree that you have now finished was she like what are you doing time to get back to it or just had a great time no, i just had a great time there was never a question of whether i was going to go back to uni we just had a great time and i do remember this was my like this was my first solo trip across europe and where i met a lot of my overseas friends and first one cool it was awesome. I traveled up and down the coast of Croatia, my home country, by myself. Um, and this was also a time when I had been consistent with my gym, more consistent than I've ever been. Like, And I was international gymming, right? Everywhere I went, I made sure that there was a gym nearby. And I still remember the selfies, like keeping myself accountable. At that time, I had Snapchat and I started Instagram to keep myself accountable, to make sure that I am showing up for me. Yeah, wow. An international gymmer. Ooh, very nice. <laughs> Put that on your business card. The Okay, and you came back and then you went to get what's, just for those that might not know, uh, what are implants and what led you to, was, was it like you came back and you now knew what they were or had you was it a thought you'd been thinking about for a while? Oh i've i always thought about breast implants so okay. since i was i remember i think i was year seven or year eight in croatia oh, so wow. yeah year seven or year eight in croatia so how old 13 years old 14 Nine, eight years i was about 13 or 14 years old when i sat down with my best friend in croatia and i was like look at you your boobs are growing mine are not and I really felt like a little boy. And when we went to the beach, I was the one that boys were like, look at you, you're so flat. What are you wearing? That's just a, it's a handkerchief around you. What are you wearing that tea towel for? You got nothing to cover up anyway. And that really got to me, it did. And my friends were the bustier ones and they were the ones that got wolf whistled at. And I was sporty and athletic and flat. <laughs> However, Kathy realized that the soft tender spot between the male's legs caused major critical damage. <laughs> yeah, wow. So, you know, you're so you're going one way, everyone's going another way, and you're noticing the disparity, but also people putting a lot on you. Mm. Yeah, fuck. And uh, anyone listening, there's a huge change in the energy right now. So that's uh, not cool. So, yeah, but wow. Eight years of that. Yeah, um, it's something that I thought about very often. I was uncomfortable going into the bra section with my mom when I was little, um, and I just felt like I was missing out on a lot. I felt like I was missing out on a lot of femininity. That's that back then. That was my mindset. My definition of femininity mm. has changed a lot since then i've done a lot of work on myself and that is what ultimately led to my explant last year you know coming up to a year soon i'm really excited about that yeah wow um <laughs> da, 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 da. um let's come back so okay eight years of this fuck and then you've gone away had a great time no lines um like and then gone right i'm doing this Talk us through that. So, like, you've then gone and done it, but which is, you know, you've now become, like, an incredible person for a lot. I think um, from memory talking with you, there wasn't at the time really much information. It was more like, oh, yeah, get implants, get them put in, over the peck, under the peck. Yeah. Uh, there's not really any issue with it. You'll be fine. Absolutely. Um, 
in 10 years it might leak and you'll have to get more you'll get no, more ones. not even that carl there's even there's that. no no one nothing. nothing about leakages no way so basically I took an interest into having breast implants because I was flat as and I started doing my research. I found a really good surgeon that had really good reviews. I looked at his work. I was really confident with him. Um, we went under the muscle because that was recommended by him, but also it is everything that I read up said under the muscle for long lasting results, it will be better and the implants will be better protected. Oh, no um, it was about choosing, do you want teardrop? shape or do you want round shape i chose the tear teardrop shape because i wanted to look more natural and then it was about choosing the size that you want and that's what my surgeon helped me with choosing the size and i was very proportioned no one really knew that i had breast implants until i explanted and unless i told them um, i'm very open and honest about it now because it is part of my journey and i found that sharing my story has helped a lot of other women reach out to me and have these talks as well about getting ready for an explant but also the side effects that they have experienced over the years of having breast implants and it's known as breast implant illness and it's not rare it is a matter of time the way that my surgeon explained it dr eva Nagy in sydney my oncoplastic surgeon that actually explanted the breast implants I think she said it perfectly when she said it's like putting a tea bag in cold water. Eventually, you're going to get tea. They're just sitting there. And I didn't know anything about the immune system back then. I didn't know when I put these two huge silicone foreign objects in my body that my immune system would be overstimulated and create scar tissue around the implant. This was not explained to me. I didn't have any of this information. I didn't look for this information. Yeah, I looked for the side effects. Yeah, I looked for possible what might happen. None of this came up. The side effects were not mentioned. It was This was nothing. Hmm. How did you... So obviously, you've had a surgery, gone teardrop natural. There's obviously with any surgery, there's a healing time. Mm -hmm. And there's... Um, probably like for me, I'm just for an example was like teeth whitening. It's like teeth look great. Like, um, you know, there's always that uh, shyness that someone has and there's a change. So there's a side effect that as what you're saying, there was a side effect. When did you notice it? Okay. So the other thing I want to mention is that, yes, it is recommended to change over breast implants every 10 years or so, 10 to 15 years. And this was mentioned. However, you know, I was 21 years old. He was thinking about what's going to happen in 10 years. Um, no one really sat down and had that conversation with me of, you know, you're going to have to go under the table, like on the table again, under the knife again. Like yeah. no one thinks about these things. And then no one explains to you the actual explant procedure and mm -hmm. That was an eight hour surgery as opposed to getting the implants was a two hour surgery, completely different. Recovery was much longer in the explant as well. So in terms of the initial surgery of implant, it was very fast. It was very uninformed and surface level and I felt taken care of by my family. Definitely my mom helped me a lot. I do remember I do remember the first kind of two weeks being the hardest, the first week in particular. They had to take me off the painkillers because I just wanted to do things. I'm a go-getter. I'm a dominant personality and I wanted to take oh. out the trash. <laughs> it was too heavy for my stitches and I didn't feel anything. So they were like, no painkillers for you. You just need to rest. Um, so I'm sorry, but I can totally see that. This bag will not beat me. <gasps> Put it down. Yeah. I'll rest remember, 10 minutes and I'll be right back. I remember, <gasps> about, I remember it taking about two hours for me to get dressed that first morning at home and probably about five minutes for me to actually open the door because I had I had no strength in my pack. My pack had just been literally cut open. <laughs> um so I do remember that it was difficult in the first kind of two weeks, but then after two weeks, it got easier and easier. And I think it was about six or eight weeks post-surgery. 
that we actually traveled overseas and that's when i started to do body weight exercises so i started to do push-ups against the wall i started to do lunges i started to do squats and no weight at this point just slowly started body weight stuff and building myself back up um yep. Yep, so you're traveling so you've got your plant implants in you've started to train traveling did you notice um immediately you know how you said in the past people were like right. oh look at you with your tissue and oh were you starting to see a shift in that paradigm or did you was it not as like you know maybe you got it but then you're like oh the grass isn't so green on this side either no 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 i was happy with them <laughs> no, <laughs> let's be real i dominated <laughs> i was top dog you man hey over here this is how you do it what uh, i was happy Louder. with my breast implants i was happy with how they looked they gave me the confidence boost that i wanted yep. they served their purpose so we're Back double double top dog we're 10 jobs <laughs> two degrees why do one travel you know skipping the lines <laughs> not because and Carl, I, I say that really openly and honestly because it's part of the story and part of the journey and at what cost because within the first two months of having breast implants my mother noticed that my skin started to go yellow so i actually started to show symptoms of jaundice my liver was under stress jaundice. and jaundice yeah so my skin started to go yellow and um around my mouth and my hands which is a result of pressure on the liver so the liver was suffering a lot um we didn't put one and one together no one thought that it was the breast implants because no one had informed me of possible side effects and breast implant illness and some women experience severe symptoms straight after they have the implants done for me it was more gradual it was a slow process the first thing that we noticed was the jaundice about i think it was about a year into having breast implants i went to my gp and i asked him what why am i yellow like what is this what's happening with my liver because at this point i would started studying dietetics and i started studying about uh, the liver and jaundice and i was like holy shit like i've got jaundice what is this from non-drinker non-smoker never done drugs I go to my GP, he runs all the blood tests, my liver enzymes were high, my cholesterol was high. So we did a um, ultrasound of the liver, no scarring. So he was just like, it is what it is. It's just your genetics. This is just who you are. 21 years old, 22 years old with all of these deranged enzymes and sh showing signs of jaundice, like, I had just accepted what he told me. I didn't have to worry about it. It wasn't until about maybe another year later, about two and a half, three years into having breast implants that I started having chest pains. And this really panicked me. I was like, what is going on? Why am I having chest pains? Is this something to do with the breast implants? Is there a rupture perhaps? So I go back to my GP and we do another ultrasound i tell him i have breast implants it is this chest pain from having breast implants uh the ultrasound showed that the breast implants were intact there was no rupture um and we brushed it off again he said no nah, nothing wrong you're fine during during that three and a half years so what 23 24 were you um like, as you said, your eating disorder was a journey. So you're now starting to probably get into the thick of nutrients and going deeper into the food elements. And you've got jaundice, which was a yellowing of the skin, a stress on the liver. You are, it's genetics. Cool. Well, your genetics means your body's working, which is great. Um, did you start to think, your doctors are like, nah, it is what it is. You're like, nah, nah, it's got to be something. It's got to be maybe nutrition. Is that when you start to dive deeper into this wellness space? not at all not at this point at all so i just took what he told me because he's the doctor and i trusted him right so whatever he said don't worry about it it's not the implants you'll be fine there's no scarring kind of a thing it's genetics um at this point i didn't know about the wellness space yet i was learning about clinical dietetics yeah, and working on the hospital ward um and working in a acute setting and 
I just brushed the jaundice aside, brushed the chest pain aside, any other symptoms that I had, I took it as it's just genetics. Like I asked him about Raynaud's disease. Raynaud's disease is where I had my fingers actually go numb and pale in cold temperatures. Um, and this had never happened before. It happened about probably four years into having breast implants, maybe three, four years into having breast implants. And I brought it up with the GP and it was like, it's just genetics. So Raynaud's disease is actually an autoimmune disease. So looking back, autoimmune disease, my immune system is in overdrive, protecting me from the toxins that are in the breast implants. I've explanted eight months ago, I'm living in minus three. I've not had any inflammation or any Raynaud's disease. Yeah, wow. Well, though that that's a few years into the future. What and so okay, we've got the implant, starting to notice there are things going on. So sorry, Siri. Um Siri wants to get involved. So you've taken the doctor's advice, going, Okay, it's it's just me. Man, my chest is hurting every day. Okay, it's just me again. If you, you finished your degree and you're working in clinics, hospitals, um, and this is where you were starting to tell us all the places you've um, worked at, I guess what I'd like to know is as your journey's, so this journey's unfolding, what are you learning from each hospital that you were traveling to? Were you connecting going, is there a connection here? Or were you just like, I want to learn about these types of people, this population? Yeah, there was no joining of the dots, no real learnings in clinical. It was an acute setting. I was working with very ill patients. Um, patients. Um, I worked in the outpatient setting a little bit, so I got to see some people after they left the hospital and they'd come back and I'd advise them. I learned about the non-diet approach, so really health at every size and focusing on health first. So that kind of goes a little bit into the wellness space, but... I um I remember my first job in being a hospital. I was there for about six months and the contract didn't continue, but the advice that they gave me and the feedback that they gave me was really valuable to me because that, I think, kind of set me on the path to wellness. So what they said was that my energy and my enthusiasm and my passion for nutrition and health would be more useful in the public health space outside of the clinical setting. So I had all these skills and I still do and I can work in the hospital setting, but that's not where my energy is best used. It's not where I want to be. I really want to be amongst generally healthy people amongst the general population really motivating them and inspiring them to take health into their own hands and becoming the best version of themselves uh okay can we can we just pull on that thread a little bit what is nutrition dietetics for those that are wondering what you've so you've started on this journey you're doing nutrition dietetics and then you've started to go towards wellness what's the difference Okay, I get where you are. I, I just want to park that one. And one thing that I forgot to say or, or want to highlight that contributed to the breast implants, contributed to getting the breast implants in the first place and then maintaining that image of this is who I am was actually getting into the fitness industry because it was started to be everywhere. It was all over my social media. It was all over my Instagram. There were these bodybuilders, bikini models with breast implants, and I was going for that look. I was going for that. I, that's what I wanted. I wanted to build the body of a bikini competitor, um, and I thought that I needed breast implants to achieve mm. that. Um, and you know, looking backwards now, it was just the mindset that I was in and as well as that environmental factor. What, what what was I feeding my mind at the time? Well, I was feeding my mind that this is what I have to do based on what I was looking at, right? We can get into that more a different time, but let me answer, oh, we will. Don't worry. <laughs> let me answer your question about the difference between nutrition and um, dietetics itself. So well, nutritionists, nutritionists have three years of study at uni or nutritionists can now actually get a certificate 
um, and accreditation by doing courses online with institutions, just like online um, in certification. Whereas dietitians have an extra year of study, the fourth year, um, and this extra year of study is all clinical and research, as I said. So it's very intense. You study much more the diet disease relationships. I'm qualified to actually prescribe certain types of diets for a person based on their clinical symptoms, based on the disease that they may be living with and managing. So that could be type 2 diabetes, that could be high cholesterol, that could be high blood pressure, that could be overweight obesity, that could be kidney disease, that could be liver disease. Whereas nutritionists, they're not qualified to do this. They're not qualified to prescribe diets. They're not qualified to work with people who have a disease. And nowadays, most of the population actually is living with some sort of a disease. Mm. So nutritionists work in the public health space. Nutritionists work maybe in policy. Nutritionists advocate for healthy eating. Um, dietitians work more so clinical they can do everything a nutritionist does and more so the way that i explain it simply is that a dietitian is a doctor for nutrition so we can do everything a nutritionist does and we can also work in hospitals yeah okay and well thanks that's really incredible and up to this point kathy you've started to delve into the wellness space for age where 23, finished our degree, we're in hospitals, we've been given feedback that we've got too much energy, uh, which is an understatement, um, too much energy and zest or passion for this area that you're not 100% on what it is yet, though you know it's something else. Mm -hmm. And you've started to dive into your fitness training. Everyone is that competes has breast implants. So cool, I've got them. This is This is the path that I should be taking and that's where I am probably going to go mm -hmm. now for those that are listening i hope you've enjoyed this part one yes part one with kathy of her just her story and journey so far uh, due to the rules of table talk we keep this under 50 minutes so tune in for part two with kathy o and myself enjoy hey thanks so much for joining the episode of table talk today we hope you found some helpful tips and inspiration in staying healthy and fit even with a busy schedule be sure to subscribe to our podcast, stay tuned for our next conversation. Until then, keep prioritizing yourself, your health, your fitness, and we'll see you on the next Table Talk.